Hi, and welcome to my show. It's my weekly Sunday show, and it's just after 12 noon Pacific. And so today, I thought I would change up the format just a little bit. We experimented with it last week, and this week um, it worked out really well. So what, we've, what we're doing is um, we have picked three questions that we think are pretty powerful from all the questions that come in from my audience, from my readers, from Facebook, from everywhere. And, uh, and Danny, my intrepid producer in the background, he will read them out for me, provided he hasn't run off to get another cup of coffee. Danny! <laughs> I know you guys want to see him in front of the camera. You have, you often say that. You really want to see him. You want to see more of him. Believe me, today you don't want to see him. He's still in his pajamas. It's past 12 noon and he's still in his pajamas. And he did that on purpose because he thinks that because he's in his pajamas, I'm not going to pull him in front of the camera. Anyway, so... Let's dive right in with our questions because I think I, I found some pretty powerful questions which you guys would like and uh, Danny also helped me to sift them down So, because there's a ton of them. So um, whenever Danny's ready, we'll start getting into them. All right, what's our first question, Boo? Hello everybody, it's me again. Um, let's see. For one of the, one of the uh, viewers last week actually put in a comment that I didn't address uh, their part of the world, didn't they? Ah. So, good eye. Yeah, how's it going down g'day. In, down in Australia? Yeah, good eye. And also, hola. Hola. Yes. Bonjour. Guten Tag. Yes. Uh, and I think that's about as far as my linguistic skills go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, and. The first question. People, are, people have written in and uh, we've actually uh, sifted through some of the ones that are more interesting. And we have a question from, from a bunch of your viewers. It basically says, and I'm paraphrasing, Anita, you had your NDE experience, but now as you try to remember or go back into that, does, does, has the memory faded or is it still as vivid as when you were in it? I love that question because um, the question shows in a way um, how people think of NDEs. You know, people f believe an NDE is somewhat like having a dream where over time the dream fades. But in, actually, in actuality, the NDE is something completely different. And I want to explain that a little bit more. Um, Having an NDE, um, and for those of you who don't know, an NDE is a near-death experience. And <clears throat> for those of you who don't know my story, although I'll be telling you a little bit about it in this video, uh, please check back some of my other videos or my book, Dying to Be Me, if you really want to understand what happened to me, the whole story with the cancer and me dying and then um, coming back and get, getting the choice to come back. So. When I was on the other side, it actually felt more real than this side. So the memory doesn't fade because it is like you went to another country. So if you imagine <clears throat> that even when years passed, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you visited a place or a country that is so completely different from where you live now. No part of it is anything like the country that you currently live in. So you never actually forget that memory because you were physically there. You were physically experiencing it. You were eating the food. You were staying in in the type of housing or homes they live in. You experienced the language, the costumes. It was an immersive experience. It's not just a visual experience. It's a full-on sensory experience. Well, the NDE or the near-death experience is even more than that. Um, and it's something that never leaves you. So I want to see how I can explain to you the way in which it's something that never leaves you. It's like <clears throat> if you, um, it's like when I was in that experience, I understood that the person who I had been up to that point was dying. 
And when I was given the choice to come back or not, I was made aware that the person I had been up to that point could not come back. It was like that person had died. And I'm talking about that personality, that, um, that energy, that personality, that person who I had been up to that point, that person had to die because that person could not continue to live the way that they were living, the way that they were being. The only way that I could come back and live again is if I, um, if, if I was, I'm going to say a different person, but in actuality, I was supposed to be my authentic self, who I am, um, who I truly am. I had to be who I truly am. But the person I had been up to that point was not the person I truly am. I was a people pleaser. I was trying to, um, I was trying to please everyone. I was a doormat uh, and, and so on. I, was, um, I have always been an empath. I was an empath before. I was an empath or still am after. However, the person I was trying to be, that person had to die for my own survival. So if I, if the memory of the NDE were to fade, what that means is I would have to revert back to being the person I used to be. Um, it means that NDE didn't have that much of an um, impact on me and that I would have to revert back to being the Anita I was before the near-death experience. But that Anita could not survive as she was. That Anita, that personality, that person I was got cancer. Not just got cancer, but got terminal cancer. I could not continue to live as that person because even if the cancer at that time if the cancer went into remission, that personality was a personal personality that would get it again. And that's really the crux of it. That personality would get it again. I had to be a different person if I wanted to live. And therefore, um, in becoming that different person, in being reborn as this different person, it has led me on a different life. And so you cannot really forget what happened that launched you on this different life. It literally is like taking the red pill. Um, it's like I walked through a portal. An NDE, an NDE, a near-death experience is not just a singular experience like a singular dream or, <clears throat> or even a singular immersive experience like going on a trip. Going on a trip to a different country is a much more powerful experience than a dream. Um, <clears throat> but a near-death experience is something even more. It's like you, um, you sort of, you die, but then when you are reborn or when you choose, if you choose to come back, which is what makes it an NDE and not a DE, not a death experience. But if you choose to come back, you're not coming back through the old doorway where you were before. You're actually stepping into a portal. It's like, it feels like you're stepping into a portal because you now know some things that you couldn't have known had this not happened to you. And so the clarity was like incredible. I understood why I had cancer and nothing can take that away. No matter what, nothing can take that away. Nothing can make you the person you were before. Um, and again, if I, sorry to repeat myself, but if I went back to being that person, I would die of cancer. Um, so I hope that kind of clarifies it. But also what I want to add here is that um, the clarity made me really understand like why I got cancer and why the world is the way it is. Um, and it felt as though even <clears throat> All the problems that we have, all the problems I have, um, it feels as though we are creating our own problems. And this is weird because uh, I don't want people to feel that it's their fault. They have their problems. And this is the dichotomy is that from that perspective, it feels like we are creating our problems 
and trying to solve our problems. And we're creating them and solving them. And what we can't see, because we can't see the bigger picture, is what is what we're having trouble seeing from this perspective is that we're unable to see that we don't need to create those problems in the first place. If we could all have an NDE, we would realize that, oh, I don't even need to create those problems in the first place. And if there was a GIF or something, uh, one of those, you know, those funny um, GIF emoji uh, emoticons that we use where you have this picture that repeats itself, what it would look like to describe what I'm trying to say is if you imagine somebody who's trying to clear a pile of garbage in front of them, and so they're like, they're like um, throwing the garbage behind them to clear it, just throwing it, throwing it, and throwing it, just picking it up, throwing it, and then they see it's all clear. It's like, ah, the garbage is clear. And then they turn around and they see the pile of garbage and they don't realize it's the same pile of garbage that they threw behind them. And they're like, oh my God, there's another pile of garbage. And so they're like picking it up and throwing it behind them, throwing it, throwing it. Ah, I cleared this pile of garbage. And then they turn around and they see another pile of garbage. So they think they have to work faster to get rid of the garbage before it comes back. So they're working faster and faster and they're like trying to race the garbage from piling up. But what they don't realize is they themselves are creating that garbage that's piling up. That's kind of what the world and our lives and it's like if there was a meme for what life looked like, that's what it would look like from that perspective. That's, um, and so when I share my story, when I talk about it, another related question that I get sometimes is, you only had one near-death experience. How come you are constantly trying to explain it in different ways? Like, why are you still writing books? And I think this person meant it as a criticism, but I actually think it's a great question. And the reason is because um, it doesn't feel like one incident. It's changed my life that in every area of my life, I am realizing that I have to react differently from the way I was taught when I was a kid. I'm, I have to react differently from the normal paradigm. I have to react differently from the way we as a paradigm, as a race, as a culture are being taught to react. So in other words, that pile of garbage was created by me and if I just, you know, clear it, it's just going to go somewhere else and I have to be able to see things from the big picture. And so in every situation, it, every situation I face gives me new content to talk about. Hence why I always have something to say and why I keep writing books because it's not as if it's one incident. It's as if I am walking on a life path or I walked through a portal that is so different from anything that I would be walking had I not had the NDE. So every step of the way, I've got new content because it's a path I didn't, um, you know, I wasn't trained for. It's a path that I don't always know the answers, but it's different from had I been that other person who got cancer. Um, so I'm just going to go into a question that we've got, and I haven't read this yet, but we'll pull it up onto the stage. It's a question from Judy Volhard Harris. Hi, Judy. Um, let's pull this question up so you can all read it. How difficult is it to totally change your life? I was a people pleaser like you, and I got fibromyalgia. I feel like through you, I'm given a chance, thank you, to change my life and therefore heal but it is so hard to do. I don't know how you change when I'm still in so much pain every day. I'm getting a chance to see you in a few weeks. Oh, that's wonderful. I wonder where. Um, I really hope we can talk and I can give you a hug. Of course we can. I would love to hug you. Um, so the events I have coming up in a few weeks, I've got UK coming up, a wonderful event in, in London, um, which I'm really looking forward, sorry, in, in Bristol that I'm really looking forward to. Love Bristol, really magical place. And I've got 1440 Multiversity in Northern California, which is a five-day retreat. So you're probably seeing me in one of those two, possibly in Basel, but I'm assuming it's uh, one of the two English speaking events. The event in Basel will be in, translated into German, but I will be speaking in English. Um, so let me answer your question. And 
How do you change? And actually the next question that we have will address it a little bit. However, um, the way that, why it is hard to change is because you are still caught up in the life uh, that you created as the person who became the sick person. In other words, if I continued to live the life that I was living before, which I had created as the person who ended up getting cancer, if I continued to live that life, I would only be in remission. And this is one of the reasons why I hate the word remission. And I always tell people, if you, if you go for healing and not just for curing, you don't go into remission. You become healed. You can say, I am done with cancer. Now it's time for me to remember my mission. And that's what I want you to do. Even with the fibromyalgia, I want you to focus on you. I want you to start remembering your mission. I want you to ask yourself questions like, um, what am I taking on that's not me? Where am I saying yes when I mean no? Where am I still pleasing people? Um, am I doing things because I want to do them or because I'm afraid of criticism if I don't do them? You know, we can do good things and be supportive to people. We can take care of people. But what is the reason why we're doing it? Are we doing it because we love the person and of course we would do it? Or are we doing it because we're afraid of criticism? If the reasons you're doing it is because you're afraid of criticism, that's the wrong reason. If you're doing it because you think you need to do it to be a good person, that's also the wrong reason. The only reason to do things for people is out of the goodness of your heart. It's the goodness of your heart and your love for those people. And the more that we take care of ourselves and the more we're able to say no to what doesn't feel right, the more energy we have, the more charged we are, and more able we are to do what to to do good things for the people we love and to come from the heart and to do good things for the planet and for other people so you know thank you for your question and um let's actually go into another one from my intrepid producer boo so boo what have you got for us as the second question the second question, and again, I'll paraphrase because it's quite a, quite a long question, but people have written in and says, Anita, tell us something you haven't shared before about your NDE, which you would share if you weren't worried that people <laughs> thought that you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried you were going to pick that one. <clears throat> so, so what would I share if I wasn't worried that people thought I was crazy? <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, it's weird. I'm trying to think of a few things because I've shared a lot. But yeah, there are things, <clears throat> you know, uh, I was so hesitant to share that I hear voices all the time. Um, but that's, that's a real truth where I really feel guided all the time. And I really mean all the time. I feel guided. I hear voices all the time. Um, so I actually um, see people or know that what is truly real is, is energy. Energy is the only word I can think of to give it. Um, so we think that our physical bodies, the physical world is real. But what I discovered when I was on the other side is that our energy, and it's too bad we're limited. The word is that the only word I can think of is energy, energy, life force energy. Um, but energy presents itself in different ways. But our energy, our energy force is realer than the physical. It's realer and has more effect on this world than our physical bodies do. And that's the thing that people don't get. And, and the thing is, if you imagine that your energy had different colors and imagine if love energy had one color and imagine if um, anger energy had another color and greed energy had another color, whatever energy you are feeling, that 
color is the energy or that is the energy that you are feeding into the hole. Um, and again, this is like sort of like the first time I'm putting it in these words because I also had Danny semi surprise me with the questions. So this is the first time I'm putting it in these words. Um, so bear with me. But um, but because we don't have words to describe the different energies. Now, imagine, though, the other thing I realized is that we are all connected. Now, if you watch my TED talk, you will get a gist of the story and you will see that I use the example of the warehouse. But if I had to share it another way, in a way of how I live my life, and very rarely do I talk about it this way, um, I live my life as if we are all connected by a web. Every single living being, every single life form, whether it's an animal, whether it's a human, whether it's a baby, whether it's a plant, if it has life, life force energy, life form, all of life force energy is connected as those strands um, and it forms like an intricate web. So I'm not going into the tapestry analogy, which many of you who know my work know I use this, but imagine if this energy is a web. So if you actually imagine a cobweb and imagine at every point of a cobweb where the energy, where the strands meet, at every point is a person, a being or an animal, is a, is a person. And that, at that point, they are emanating the, the various strands, the various energies out into the web. So each of us, unbeknownst to us, are emanating this energy all the time. We're emanating it whether we realize it or not, but we are also receiving energy from the web whether we realize it or not, all the time. And the reason why I always tell people, love yourself, can you, uh, I, I always say, love yourself like your life depends on it. Because when you love yourself, what you are actually doing is you are, uh, as people are sending all these different energies in this web, you are aligning yourself with the love energy and you are sending out love energy. So in other words, you're actually contributing love energy into this web. Um, very often people will say to me that um, you can't always love yourself. You have to face things like um, that there are things in the world to get angry about. You've got to go out and get angry and you've got to be an activist. Now, I know some people love to do that and it's great. If it feels good to you, that's good. You have to look at what, what are the emotions, what is the energy that it brings out in you because... And this is the part that a lot of people don't get, and I don't share it because they'll think I'm crazy. It's not what you do. It's the energy behind what you do. So in other words, if you're out there protesting, but it's making you feel really good, it's making you feel, I am doing this because I love myself, I love the world, I love humanity. And when you look at the people in the past, like Martin Luther King or whoever in the past who have been out there and protested and changed the world, they have done it because it's a part of their cosmetic makeup. It's the energy behind what they do. It's the intention behind what they do. However, if you are out there um, protesting and angry because people are making you feel guilty if you don't do it or if you feel trapped, if there is like an anger energy and you're the kind of person that is going to, um, you know, beat up someone who doesn't agree with you or people around you are only going to join your protest or your campaign because they're scared of your reaction if they don't and you tell people like, you have to take action, you have to take action. Actually, no, they don't. Because if they take action from the wrong place, they're contributing, they're, um, they're contributing the wrong kind of energy into the web. I don't know if I'm making sense, but another way to say it is that animals don't go out and protest. 
yet they contribute a lot to our web because they have an energy, a peaceful energy that uplifts the planet. There are many people who are monks and hermits who are in their retreats that don't interact with the world. They uplift their planet by contributing their uplifting energy to the web. And so this is one of the things I want to, um, I want to say, which I always find it really hard to express this because whenever I try to express it, there, um, there are always people who feel that we need to take action. What we really need to understand is where is that, what is the energy that action is coming from? And people need to be honored, not for the action they're taking, but for the energy which they are coming from. So in other words, if somebody feels I am not the right person to take action. I prefer to uplift the energy from the background. I don't want to be guilted into taking action and into getting angry. Um, I don't want to be guilted into getting angry at all these movement, at, at people being exposed and coming out. I feel better uplifting the planet because, because if they are forced into taking action or guilted into taking action, the energy they're contributing to the world ends up being a fear-based energy or an anger-based energy. So basically that's my con convoluted way of saying that our energy is realer than our physical body. So the other thing is when I was on the other side, things that I never talk about or rarely talk about is that because of this belief that our energy is actually realer than our physical body, I don't believe that illnesses, particularly illnesses like cancer, are what we think they are. That's something that is sometimes a controversial subject, but I don't believe it is what we have been led to believe it is. I believe that our, our Western medicine is so deeply entrenched into thinking it is one thing that it is going to be a long time before they can um, pull themselves out of it. But um, we have created something, we've created a monster and that monster is called cancer. And we are, by creating this big fear around cancer and creating diagnostic tools with earlier and earlier detection, which finds um, cancer cells before they're even going to turn into cancer cells, we are creating something that doesn't exist and then trying to create a solution for something that doesn't exist. Now, remember in my previous section, I said to you, imagine a, a GIF or a meme of somebody like clearing the garbage by clear by throwing it behind them and they think ah I'm clearing the garbage and they turn around and they see oh my god there's another pile of garbage and they clear it and then they turn around oh my god there's another pile of garbage they are creating their own problem this is what we've done in our medical industry this is what I truly feel this is something I rarely talk about um, and what I'm going to do is perhaps because of this question what would I talk about if I wasn't afraid of being considered um, stupid or, or whatever, crazy, or if I wasn't being afraid of critics or being crazy, that is a subject I could speak a lot more about because truly I feel a lot of people have the wrong idea about what illness is and a wrong, the wrong idea about what cancer is because even when we go into natural uh, even when I speak about how to come out of it, you're dealing with cancer. How can you um, come out of it? So first of all, I would want you to know that death is not the end. Death is actually beautiful. Um, there have been many times when I have kind of felt, oh my God, why did I come back? It was so much easier on the other side. Not to say you should take your life sooner. See, that's another thing that I'm don't always talk about, but yeah, death is beautiful, but I would never ever encourage anyone to take their life earlier. I would absolutely discourage it because uh, the fact that you're still here means there's still gifts waiting for you. But if you cross over, it does not mean you have lost the battle. So if you have relatives that have crossed over, they have not lost the battle. They've gone somewhere really beautiful. Um, but having said that, it is a whole shift of paradigm. And there are, um, and one of the things I do is, uh, and I'm starting to do this now, I will be creating more content on truly how to shift. But here is the challenge. This is the biggest challenge. 
is that we still have to live in this world where we are surrounded by people who are going to make us feel we're crazy. Now, I am beyond it right now. So, so the truth is, I don't worry that people say, oh, you're crazy. What you're saying about cancer is so not true and whatever. I am so beyond it only because my life has changed so much and I've walked so far along this path and I have a tribe. I have so many people who support what I'm saying. My concern is more about you, the people who I share what I say with. You haven't had the experience I've, I've experienced. And so when I'm sharing with you, you're trying to you're trying to integrate what I'm saying about, um, about the other side while living on this side and dealing with people who are going to tell you that the person you're learning from is crazy. That's my concern. And hence, very often, even why I give you content as to what to give skeptics is not because I am worried about the skeptics. I'm kind of gone beyond that. I give that to you so that you can share it with the skeptics so that it helps you while you are trying to heal your physical body. Um, because um, just to throw at least one more thing for you if you're dealing with an illness is that um, always, always choose from the place of love and not fear. And that includes choosing your doctors, your healers. If you have a doctor that makes you feel fear, I mean, I sometimes read stories from people where they say their doctors pretty much, you could almost say blackmail them into feeling that if you don't go this route, uh, you are going to die. No doctor has the right to do that to you. I would change doctors. I swear I would. Doctors need to know that you have a choice. It's your body. It's your life. And if only you knew that your physical body is only 20 around 20% 20 of who you are, the real you is pure energy. And watch my um, video on tip of the iceberg and law of attraction, where I speak about one of the biggest things I discovered when I crossed over is that the real you is so much more than your physical body. And your physical body is like just the tip of the iceberg. It's what you can see. But the real you is pure consciousness. It's pure energy, but it's more powerful than your physical body. That is what I want you to know. And any doctor that takes that away from you, any doctor that makes you feel that you are going to die, any doctor that makes you feel there's nothing I can do for you, um, you are terminal, you are going to die, they should be fired. What they're doing is dangerous. And anyone who says that what I'm doing is dangerous, all I'm doing is giving you hope. All I'm doing is telling you that nobody can take that away from you. And anybody that does, they're being dangerous. So yeah, that's what I would share with you if I wasn't afraid of being called crazy. <laughs> um, so now let's go to our third question. These are great questions. Mm. Just a moment. I see there's a question from Laredo Taurus. Hi, Laredo. Laredo has been fantastic at helping me with my Facebook groups. Um, so let's punch it up on the screen. Laredo asks, what kind of practice exercise discipline would you recommend to help us to develop and improve our perception of the energy that you're referring to? Okay. That is a really, really good question. Um, so the kinds of practice I would do is first of all, um, I, I would actually pull up some of the information that I shared with you in the video I did last week about healing sanctuaries. I would ask myself questions like, um, have I suffered a trauma recently? Am I lonely? Uh, does my life have purpose and meaning? Do I say yes when I mean no? Have I taken on more than I can chew? Um, Am I doing things, a lot of things that I don't enjoy doing? Here's another one. Do I feel used? Am I being abused? Do I feel that my relationship is imbalanced and unfair? Do I feel I'm giving more than I'm receiving? Um, one thing that's also very important is to learn to receive because when you don't know how to receive, 
You also don't know how to receive healing. When you start doing these things, you start to get into a place of more clarity and then you start to tune in a little bit more. Take time to be quiet, to be peaceful, um, spend time meditating. But when I say meditating, to me, meditating means many things. A lot of people kind of give meditation a specific meaning and then they're really strict on themselves if they're not able to sit in one spot. No, for me, meditating is listening to music, uh, walking by the ocean on the beach, listening to the ocean, spending time with pets. You know, there's a lot of things that covers meditating. Um, I love doing things like that all these kinds of things. But, um, but do check back on my last video. And in that I give a lot of things. The information I give you for healing sanctuaries is really, really helpful to get started on a healing journey. And, uh, and of course that's the kind of thing that I also do in my, um, in my retreats in my five day retreats, we set up, we set you up to kind of go on a healing journey so that even after you're out of the retreat, you continue to go on the journey. So thank you for that question, Loretta. That was a great question. Um, there is a great, another great question on the screen and, uh, it's from Elizabeth Kardick. Um, Elizabeth asks, hello, dear Anita. How did your marriage change after your life changed? Did your husband follow you on your path? How did that work? Now, I was very blessed to have my pajama clad husband, Danny, <laughs> to follow me on my path. Yes. So seriously, um, the challenge of something like this is that we are sometimes, I know of near death experiences. I know of many near death experiences whose marriages crumbled after such an experience. And this is the challenge. And this is, uh, so it's almost like you feel you're put in a position where you either have to choose between the life you've created up to this point, um, or move forward and leave that life behind and go into your new life. And when, or if, if the marriage crumbles or if relationships, let's not just say marriage, but let's say if relationships crumble and there are aspects of your life that you need to leave behind, what that tells you is that it tells you that those things that you created before, before the near death experience were not from that space of authenticity. They were coming from a different space of trying to do what was right by society or trying to please other people. They, um, because when you have a near death experience, it makes you, so you know how I said that who you really are is energy. You, that's the bigger part of you. Let's say 80% of you is energy and only 20% of you is physical. So when you have a near death experience, it's like you wake up to that 80% of you, that becomes what's real. And when you wake up to that, it's like there's this clarity that, oh my gosh, I came into this world to be this, but this is how I got knocked off my path. This is how this, this, this happened instead. I was supposed to do this. You had the free will. So our destiny is what is our intention to come here to do. So basically the difference between destiny and free will is your destiny is what you intended to come here and fulfill. That's how I see it anyway, but you have the free will as to whether to fulfill it or not. And what throws us off, what throws us off from our destiny is when we choose from a place of fear, a place of uh, fearing, displeasing other people, fearing, not fitting into our society, fearing, not having enough money. All these fears <clears throat> make us go off the rails of what we kind of decided to do when we came into the world uh, and make us make choices that are more for the physical, the physical body and other people's physical. So, um, so basically if the marriage doesn't work, um, you have two choices either to force it to work, but it would mean forcing yourself to be a part of who you were before or embracing yourself a hundred percent, including 
um, you know, your 100% meaning, including the energy part of you, the intention of who you came here to be, following your dreams, following your heart, embracing all of you, and then allowing who is meant to be in your life to stay in your life and allowing who is not meant to be in your life to fall away. And when you do it in a certain way where you're embracing your energetic self, when you're embracing that it's energy first, even the falling away uh, will be done in a more, in an amicable way where two people realize that they're not on the same path anymore. It's not about fighting. It's not about making enemies. But when two people realize that they should only be together out of choice. Um, so really, when you, when you live your life that way, then the people who come into your life are in your life because they want to be not because they have to be. And they're in your life because you want them to be, not because you need them or not because you feel they need you. I hope what I'm saying makes sense. But with Danny, that's actually what happened. He was changed by my NDE. And the interesting thing is, uh, and there has been studies done, is that when couples are together while one of them is going through the NDE, they both feel it because again, remember, it's an energy thing. It's not a physical thing. His energy, my energy, we are all connected. He was in the room with me. He wouldn't leave my side. He was holding my hand 24 seven. The near death experience changed both of us. Sometimes it can be a little more difficult if, uh, when you have a couple where one has a sudden NDE and another one is maybe on the other side of the world. And if they are really close, where their energies are already linked, that person on the other side will still feel it. But if they already have issues, then the NDE is going to highlight the issues, not fix it. So if they're already living kind of separate lives, then it's going to highlight it. So in Danny's and my case, we were already close, but it brought us even closer together. So I hope that answered your question. Um, so let's go with the last question. I think we have one final one. And, uh, and so the final question, which is a short one. How did you know this was going to be a short question? <laughs> or is that a secret instruction to me to get on with it and ask quickly? No, that was, it was a secret instruction to you because I'm aware that we're running close, close to the hour. <laughs> so. This is a question that a lot of people have asked, including during today's show. So I'm paraphrasing here a question for a lot of people. And the question is, Anita, can you still access that NDE space anytime you want? Yes, I believe I can. Um, I do believe I can access it anytime, but, um, and here's the crux. If I did not change my life drastically, if I tried to squeeze back into living the life I used to live before the NDE, then I would be struggling much, much more. I would have to shut off that NDE space. But the way that it is now, I feel as though I have access to that space all the time. And it's as though my job is to integrate that space into this space. So my, it feels as though my purpose is to have one foot on each side, if you will. Um, the minute I feel I am too much on this side, it feels jarring. I don't like it. And so I immediately have to jump into that side. And what I mean by this is, um, it means that I have to either listen to music that takes me there. There's certain music that really transports me there very quickly. Um, and, and even though I don't always say that I heard music on the other side, it's weird because I don't remember hearing music specifically. And yet there is music that I hear, listen to here which reminds me of being on the other side and takes me there right away. And this is why 
I love working with musicians like Barry Goldstein, Geraldine Glass, people like that, because I love to work with them to create music that immediately transports me to that side. Music seems to do it because it gets into places in your energy, in your energy field, in your energy being that other things can't. Um, I know people are able to do it with plant medicine. I tend not to use that. I've tried it once, but uh, I tend to do it very quickly with music, being out in nature, shutting off the world. I do it very quickly. So yes, I can, I can access it. And for me, I actually believe I'm there a lot of the time and have to be, um, and, and if I find that my, what I'm doing, my work or the things I'm doing is bringing me here too much, I find it jarring and I have to stop doing everything. And the things that bring me here, um, the things that bring me to, or bring me out of that state are things like um, saying yes when I mean no, or reacting from a place of fear instead of love, or doing things out of guilt, or doing things because other people are demanding it of me, but it's not something I feel like doing. Those are the kinds of things that bring me out of that state. But when I am in tune, like even being asked a question like, uh, what would you talk about if you weren't worried that people think you're crazy? Oh my God, immediately I'm in that state, you know, and, and I'm feeling, I feel like the, the information is just coming through me. So my default state is being there, but I know I have to have one foot on each side to function. But the minute I feel the other foot step into this side, it feels jarring and I need to put the foot back on the other side. And speaking of music, um, Barry Goldstein, he's going to be on the show, I think in a week or two. I'm having him as a guest. He's coming to stay in my home for a couple of days because we have just finished creating a CD with his music and my, um, you know, and I wrote the script of the meditation. It's a guided meditation to take you on your own near-death experience journey. So I've written a script to do that and we have created a CD and Barry has written the music to get you into that state and with my words to take you and to guide you through the imagery of what I want you to experience while you're there. So we've created the CD together. He's coming over from Arizona to put the finishing touches on it together. And I'm going to have him as a guest on, uh, on my Facebook, on a video. So, um, I, so I look forward to that. I look forward to having him on here with you and for him to talk with you and for us to talk more about that CD. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, please tune in next week. I'll be back next week. In the meantime, please check out my other videos. And again, I'll say this again. I love seeing you at my events. I love doing the events. There's a different energy at live events. Again, remember we're all about energy, even though I love doing these Facebook videos as well. Um, it's, uh, you're, you know, I still speak about a lot of similar things, but at the live events, we kind of have this group energy thing going and we actually, um, we actually experiment with healing, with increasing our energy, and we create healing experiments within the live events and within, this, the, um, within the retreats. So I will see you all, and hopefully I will even see you on the cruise, on the cruise in June, um, because that's, that's one of the events I'm really excited about. Thank you all for tuning in. Take care and have a wonderful week. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.